This episode is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com. Level up your Raspberry Pi with our all-in-one arcade kit using genuine Sanwar arcade parts. And OneClickPrint.com for your photos on canvas, acrylic, gifts and more. Local craftsmen and global delivery. Hello Cave Dwellers. Can you believe the PlayStation is 25 years old? It's crazy, I know. It hit our European shores in 1995, a little earlier elsewhere, and it quickly shook off the competition from Sega to become the coolest console on the block. Well, now it's starting to eye up comfortable shoes and cardigans and I refuse to let it grow old gracefully, which is why we're slipping inside it today. The Sio, not the PSIO, because the I in the name is a Roman numeral for a one. Not confusing at all, I know. And it comes from the wonderfully named Cybdyne Systems, which will sound familiar to any Terminator fan. This isn't Skynet for your PlayStation though, it's an FPGA based flash card onto which you can store up to 1000 PlayStation CD images and launch them without the need for CDs or a reliance on its aging CD-ROM mechanism. It promises all the convenience of the PlayStation Classic, but unlike that system or indeed subsequent PlayStations that offer backwards compatibility, it's not emulating anything outside of the CD-ROM interface you're banging on the original hardware for the most authentic experience possible. This you're gonna to want to see, but first we need to install it and that requires the use of our soldering iron. So let's talk more as we take it over to the lab and get it fitted. Here then is our trusty PlayStation and yes, I'm aware it's got a layer of filth on it and I'll give it a clean later. I owned a PS2 back in the day and not a PS1, I was a PC gamer at the time, but I will confess I did rent the system many times from the local video store to play Point Blank and Gran Turismo. The Sio comes in a wonderfully official looking box, it could easily have been a Sony product from back in the day, and it's been around for some time now. First conceived in 2010, a prototype appeared in 2012 and it has matured and developed ever since into the product it is today. In the box we get some wire a switch PCB and the cartridge itself which plugs into the parallel port of the PlayStation. Not all systems have this port as it wasn't really used much so it was dropped from the design of later models. The switchboard detects if the Sio is inserted or not. If it is, it uses it. If not, it boots as if it's a normal PlayStation, but either way the CD drive is still operable. It doesn't render the CD drive useless. But what the switchboard is not is a mod chip. It won't let you boot copied CDs. Cybdyne say they could enable code to do that, but they don't for legal reasons, which is understandable. And this is where soldering comes in. We'll need to cut some traces and solder some wires to the switchboard to make the Sio work. Now there are 21 versions of the PS1 which are compatible with the Sio, and I'll include a link in the description so you can check yours. And of course, they all have the parallel port on the back. So if you don't have that, then it's game over for you at this point. Because there are so many variants and an installation guide for each system board, my installation may vary from yours, but the techniques are the same. And the official installation guides are very detailed, so you'll know exactly what goes where. My particular PlayStation appears to have a security sticker on it from the local police in the St. Helens area near Liverpool. I didn't steal it, officer. I promise. Now, let's crack this open. The PS1 is relatively simple to work on. This is the power supply unit here on the left, and as always, please take proper precautions to make sure it's discharged and it's not going to bite you. The remainder of the system comprises of shielding and the chassis, which will get out of the way. There's also the front ports for the memory cards and the controllers, the CD-ROM assembly, and then the system board itself. All of the ribbon cables just pull out, save for the CD-ROM data cable here. You'll need to pop the lock on the port first, so don't force that one out. And then the whole CD-ROM assembly lifts off. It's surprisingly easy to replace or remove for maintenance if you have CD problems. Mine works, but I will put some fresh grease on it later to keep things running smoothly. 
We can then access the system board and with just a couple more screws, it lifts out. And I'll also disassemble the remainder of the system for cleaning later and free this dead ant who met a uh, shocking end in the PSU. What a way to go. Fully disassembled, that's our PlayStation, and that's not so scary as it is certainly not a Pioneer laser active in its complexity, but I did find a surprise inside my system. On the reverse of the system board is a mod chip, a very common one in fact, which would have allowed the use of copied CDs, but it's been installed here with blue tack and tape. Just look at it. I mean, it works, and it probably has worked for 20 years, so I shouldn't really be too much of a snob when it comes to this kind of backstreet engineering, but I think I will take it out of my system and then give the board a good clean up with some IPA before we proceed. The SIO will work quite happily with mod chips in place, you don't necessarily have to take them out, but I'm unlikely to actually need to use copied CDs anymore. I'll use the SIO for that purpose, so I'll just get it out of the way as well as the blue tag. Here on the screen then is the installation manual for my particular board, which is a PU8 board. And like I said, yours may be very different, but the techniques involved in cutting traces are the same. I do that here with a scalpel, being very careful not to follow through and cut other traces. I'm cutting towards a component leg here, which is acting as a kind of buffer should I slip, rather than then cutting straight across all the other traces. And once you're happy with your cut, you want to use a multimeter in continuity mode to check that the trace has actually been cut and there's no longer continuity there. We'll also need to solder wire onto existing traces at the vias. To prep the area for soldering, I like to gently scrape the solder mask away with the scalpel. And then if it needs more attention with a glass fiber pencil to expose the copper and give us something to solder to. Now my eyes are still pretty good, but this is the limit really of what I can work at without magnification, so you might want to consider a basic magnifier to help you with this job. With the requisite traces cut and areas prepared for soldering, we can then stick the switchboard on using the self-adhesive tape on the back of it. No blue tack required. And then we just need to run the wires as instructed. To strip the ends of the wire, sometimes I use wire cutters, but I also use the iron to strip the plastic off of the wire, which also serves to tin the wire in the process. But if you do that, just make sure you keep the tip nice and clean if you've been burning plastic away with it. Now when adhering the wires, it's always a good idea to dab some liquid flux onto your solder point to make sure it behaves if impurities have worked their way into the existing solder. And also get some fresh solder on your iron to help conduct the heat and also get a good strong bond with the wire itself as you dab it on there. On the switchboard itself, I've just put a bead of solder on each pad ready to slip the cable straight into it with a touch of heat. And tweezers are another useful tool for such a fiddly job to help you work accurately if you've had too much coffee beforehand like me. All the tools and equipment you might need are included in the video description where you'll find an Amazon shop I curate, and even if you don't buy from there, it might give you some ideas for tools, so do check it out. And then we simply rinse and repeat, eventually coming to the blue wire here, which is tapping into the power for the switch PCB, and then another for the ground. And with that, we're ready to test it out. And you'll have noticed there that I tidied it all up with some Captain tape. Now on my SD card here, this is a 64 gig card, 
I've copied a file named menu.sys, which you can access from the Cybedyne website using your serial number and order number to get into their secure download area. So I suggest you download them and keep them safe just in case anything should ever happen to that website. And then I've copied some CD images onto the card. The device supports both multi-CD games and games that use Redbook Audio, but we'll look at all of that shortly. I just want to do some basic testing first to see if it works. Now the SIO goes into the back in the parallel port, as you know. There is a little bit of wobble actually when you put it in there, so maybe there's a use for our blue tank after all to hold it into place, because the SD card is hot swappable and you don't want it wobbling. Make sure we put it in the right way around, as and when you pop the SD card in and out. But there's really very little reason to take this IO out once it's in there. So, so long as your SD card is fully loaded and all set up, it should all remain in place pretty much all the time until you come to use those multi CD games, because to notify the device you want to swap the CD, you just pop the SD card out and back in again like that, and it will move on to the next CD. So yeah, a little bit of security there to stop the wobble might help. But that aside, let's connect it all up. Let's plug the capture system in for you and we'll explore what the SIO can do. After an initial setup screen that asks you some very basic questions, like if you're in the PAL or NTSC region, the device fires up and my games are displayed in a nice simple menu. I say games, it's really just showing all the folders in the root of my FAT32 or XFAT formatted SD card and subfolders aren't supported, so you can organize in that way, but it does put them in alphabetical order. System console in the list isn't a game, it's just a folder with the Windows tool that I happen to have on the SD card. Select a game and you get a placeholder image where you can put your own box art, which is a nice touch, and you can see more details about the game, such as the region, if it's a multi-disc game, and some other information, which we'll come on to shortly. So let's launch this game as we have it selected. This is Spyro. The SIO emulates the CD-ROM coprocessor and flashes away there as the virtual CD is accessed. It's doing this at 352 kilobytes per second or the dual speed of the original CD-ROM on the system. So there's no speed increase there, but of course there are no seek times and there's no delay in spinning the CD up. So the whole thing does make for a quicker experience. The parallel port on the PlayStation 1 can handle up to 3 megabytes per second to the system bus, so it's well within its capabilities to be running in this way. And there is Spyro running just fine. Out of the official 2435 software titles for the system, Cybedyne quote a 99.8% compatibility rate. I have come across one small issue myself and I'll show you that in a moment, but I'm busy playing Spyro right now mum, I can't come for dinner. Games like Castlevania Symphony of the Night run flawlessly with its beautiful symphonic music, and it's these 2D games which I really want to enjoy on the PS1 if I'm honest. First gen 3D console games really don't hold up well on the whole, unless they're cleverly stylized. You get a lot of muddy textures and short draw distances, but the 2D library is a goldmine for me. Among my favourites are the Castlevanias, Heart of Darkness, Raiden DX, Rayman and of course Oddworld, and there are also those great 2.5D games like Strider 2, they're all still immensely playable and they look fantastic. It wasn't all smooth sailing though, I hit my first problem when it came to Ridge Racer! The game runs fine, but as the race starts, the thumping soundtrack is extremely noticeable in its absence. This is because the game would stream Redbook audio from the CD, that's regular audio tracks, just like a normal music CD. Two laps to go. To fix this we need to use the system console tool and use the multiple binary image merge option in the menu here. This will pull all of the bin files, there's one for each audio track, it will merge them into one file and it will add a file with a CU2 extension. A quick look at the CU2 file shows the details of all the music tracks are now in there, and the SIO uses that to make the magic happen. Let's try a race now, and we'll see what happens. Three, two. That's 
more like it. The same system tool can be used to tell the SIO that a game has multiple CDs and to swap the CD during gameplay, you just pop the SD card out and back in and it does the rest. So that tool is really useful for making all of these things work and you'll want to invest a little bit of time tidying up your PlayStation game library to work correctly with the SIO in this way. Trying out the G-Con 45 also works great. The SIO menu detects and supports navigation with light guns, so you don't even need to plug a joypad in to launch a game if that's your bag. But I did hit another issue here, and that's when I went to launch Point Blank. All I got was a blank screen. This though showed the maturity of the product because to get it working, I just needed to dip into the extensive knowledge base on the Cybdyne website where any game issues are listed along with a fix or the progress of work on a fix. In the case of Point Blank, I just needed to change an option here as instructed and then it launched just fine. Diving deeper into the options on this device then, let's have a quick flick through some of them. We can change the video mode from PAL to NTSC. If you're using a PAL CRT like me, you'll need an RGB AV cable, otherwise you'll be sending the wrong colour frequency to the display and I'll just get a black and white image. But that's just how it is, that's not a SIO thing, that's how PAL and NTSC works, it's the same on a regular PlayStation. We can turn menu, clicks and clunks on and off, we can select the PS1 splash screen, whether it's the one I'm familiar with or the Japanese one, or you can skip that screen altogether by enabling fast boot mode. Other options include menu music choices, a burning timer so as not to damage your CRT if you leave it on, a choice of colours for the menu bar, Japanese navigation which swaps a couple of the pad buttons around, and so on and so on. The more interesting options though are the MC68HC705 licence, that sets the string in the CD-ROM controller to SCEA, SCEE or SCEI, signifying different regions as some games like Dino Crisis check for this string to run. And then execution mode lets you choose between various methods of executing the titles. Mid-boot mode reboots the PlayStation, skips the startup procedure and uses the BIOS to execute the game directly, while load exec loads the executable into RAM and jumps to it while preserving some elements in memory and registers. Basically, between mid-boot and the four load exec modes, which are set using the EXT DSP mode option in the menu, you can find a set in there to make your game run if it's causing trouble, just like we did in Point Blank. So if you run into problems, have a play with these or hit the knowledge base and it will likely tell you to change one. I'll save our changes and now that we don't have fast boot on, I can reset and we can enjoy the splash screen. Perhaps the greatest boot up screen on any console ever, in my opinion, and notice how they've snuck the SIO in as part of that screen text now. All of this trickery is achieved by a chip in the SIO that we've seen on the channel before. At the heart of the SIO is the Altera Cyclone 3 FPGA chip. We've seen it on such devices as the Vampire in Amiga Accelerators and the Mr. FPGA project, and it would appear that in the right hands there really is nothing that this chip can't do. It's an exciting time for retro gamers. So what have we learned today then? This device really does show the maturity of a product that's been in 10 years of development from the early days when it shipped in a repurposed action replay cartridge to the lovely injection molded case that it has today and the packaging that just looks like it could have come straight out of a Sony factory. At 149 Australian dollars, 80 UK pounds or 104 US dollars, of course it really should look and operate well. And it does. The price brings you a great way to enjoy convenience without compromising on authenticity and I think it really is a must have for any hardcore PlayStation gamer or indeed a developer, because there's nothing to stop you from using uh, homebrew titles on the SD card or plugging a USB cable directly in from a Windows PC and squirting your programs down into it. Yes, it would be nice if it was a plug and play solution like the new GC ROM device that's coming for the GameCube, 
but um, it really shouldn't be too hard to find someone who can help you to install that switchboard. Or, worst case scenario, you can send your PlayStation off to Sidedyne Systems to get it done for you. All links to the product, tools that you've seen, and anything else that we've chatted about today is in the video description. I hope you've enjoyed looking at the SAO today. I really have enjoyed using it. And I think I'll spend the rest of the day cleaning up this really grubby PlayStation to make it look as good as new. And um, it will take pride of place. I will enjoy taking this out and showing it in combination with the SAO when friends come to visit the cave. It really is a great combination. So until next time, I hope you've enjoyed today's video and take care. If you enjoy my content and would like to support the cave while receiving a completely ad-free experience and access to releases one week before they go public, then visit patreon.com forward slash retro man cave and join the official cave dwellers. Thank you for your support.